So we're here today with David Weinstein, um, who is a professor of economics at Columbia University. Um, and he's not just a professor, he also is one of our grantees in our inaugural grant round with a really fascinating project called In Search of the Financial Accelerator. Um, David, tell us a little bit about that project that you have in mind. Well, the project originated from time that I'd spent in Japan and, and my studies of Japan. Uh, and it, it involves trying to understand how the financial market affects the real economy. So what that means is that what we've gone through in the United States is a major financial crisis in which a large number of financial institutions uh, became troubled, failed, uh, needed to be bailed out. And as we were trying to contemplate what the impacts that would have on the real economy, that is just manufacturing firms or firms outside of the-, the And employment. And, and employment, mm -hmm. and for people who are not uh, on Wall Street, that is what were the implications of Wall Street for Main Street, one of the things I realized is that we didn't have a lot of data and uh, evidence to work off of uh, within the United States. Uh, Japan, by contrast, went through a quite comparable financial crisis in which land prices collapsed, major banks failed, major securities companies uh, collapsed as well. And Japan could provide us with a lot of information about what happens during a financial crisis to firms, to workers, uh, and to the, co the economy more broadly. Now, one of the reasons that Japan is such a great case is not just that it had a, a crisis, but that they have this incredible data there that you're, that you're, that you're exploiting. Tell us a little bit about that data set. Yeah, so, so one of the problems in studying this is that data in the United States tends to be uh, fairly divided into different silos. So you have data on firms and you have data on banks, uh, but uh, you don't have good data that links the banks to the firms. And for historic reasons, the Japanese have been tracking the, all the loans that major Japanese enterprises get from every single bank. So what one can look at is when a bank fails, so long-term credit bank was the ninth largest bank in the world and collapsed in um, the late 1990s, we can see what happened to firms that borrowed from long-term credit relative to what happened to firms that didn't. And did this cause those firms that were reliant on that bank to uh, cut employment, to, to reduce sales, and what have you, and really look at that transmission mechanism from Wall Street to Main Street or from uh, the Japanese financial sector into mm -hmm. the, the real sector. Because, so it sounds so in Japan, the credit system is very much bank-based, not so much uh, market-based as it is in the United States that was part of this crisis. And well, so that's the data you have, is on this, these relationships. Yeah, although, although it is on these relationships. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's important to remember that, that by the 1990s, the Japanese had also uh, liberalized their equity and bond markets so that uh, there were active uh, uh, securities markets uh, somewhat similar to what we saw in the United States. Mm -hmm. and indeed, as substitutes for as bank credit. As substitutes mm -hmm. for bank credit. And indeed, that's part of the reason why Japan got into such a, such a big problem. And we see very similar patterns uh, between what happened in the United States in 2007 and 8, um, and in the the, the run-up to the the financial crisis, and what happened in Japan with financial market liberalizations and deregulation, uh, leading to a major asset bubble in the late 1980s, which then um, collapsed and created this crisis. Interesting. So the parallels are even closer then. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's really the run-up to the main event. <laughs> well, we hope that this was the main event. <laughs> uh, the, the yeah, what I hope is the main event. Yes. That's correct. <laughs> um, so you have a huge amount of data. How do you make sense of it and tell a story from this? What we do is we, we look at firms within the same industry. So, for example, we may look at firms in the automobile sector. And you'll have... Toyota and you'll have Nissan and uh, Honda, etc. Some of those firms will be reliant on banks that are uh, relatively healthy and others are going to have been receiving loans from banks that were unhealthy. And then the trick is to look at 
when a bank becomes unhealthy, what happens to the sales and employment and investments by the firm that is related to that bank? And so what we're looking at concretely is if Toyota was reliant on Sakura Bank, uh, that bank no longer exists. When Sakura Bank runs into trouble, do we see Toyota sales and employment fall faster than the sales and employment of, say, Honda, which might be reliant on a healthy bank? Mm -hmm. So you're comparing, you're able to pair these up and compare, and compare their experiences. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, now shifting gears a little bit, one of the reasons that you're the right person to do this is, is because you've been really studying Japan and various dimensions of, of the Japanese economy for really your whole life. Right, right. So you're, you're a Japan expert. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I uh, went to Japan when I was uh, actually just a baby and uh, I worked in Japan for a while. And Do you I, speak Japanese? I speak Japanese and I found Japan fascinating because here you had a country that was in the second largest economy in the world, uh, just displaced by, by China, uh, now it's the third largest economy in the world, very advanced, but the institutional structure of Japan was totally different than what we saw in the United States and its history was completely different and its language was different and its culture was different. And so it was a real challenge to me as, a, as an economist to try to think about a country that had very different regulatory structures and very different work mm -hmm. ethics and, and other things, and to try to think, how do we explain this? But it sounds to me like you became a Japan scholar before you became an economics scholar. Absolutely, yes. So why did you choose to do economics? I did economics because Economics is one of the most general fields that you, can, that you can enter into. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And what I realized about economics is that, broadly speaking, economics is quantitative social science. So if you're interested in people and numbers, economics is wonderful. And because the questions that economists ask are not simply related to accounting or, or you know, profits and loss statements of firms, but it's related to uh, welfare and it's related to unemployment and income inequality. It's related to all sorts of issues that now get referred to as freakonomics, uh, issues related to political economy, how the government functions, how that interacts. And one of the wonderful things about being an economist is that you can investigate a whole host of different issues. And to paraphrase George Bernard Shaw, if you're bored of economics, you're bored of life. Uh, there's just so many different interesting questions that you can do that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, you're, you're an exemplar of that willingness. I mean, you, you say this is economics, but in a way there's a natural interdisciplinarity to this that comes from being interested in, in a country instead of a method, okay? Leads you to naturally be choosing whatever problems are, are there in Japan. Yeah, and absolutely, and, and, and one has to be interdisciplinary because it, for a lot of questions, it's really important to read historians or political scientists or environmental studies, ecological studies, or reading um, uh, the, the work of, of, of um, military historians or, or military leaders um, in some work I've done on, on, on the Second World War. So that just feeds into the, to the analysis mm -hmm. Uh, very naturally, and that's also part of the fun because you know you can choose a project, and uh, suddenly you're working on World War II, and you're reading about the bombing of cities, and then the next day you're 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 working on another project where you're looking at um, the purchases of particular barcoded goods by particular households, and and it's it's a, amazingly interesting and rich, and another feature of being an economist is that the field itself is still in its relative infancy. So it's only been about a hundred years or so that we've been doing fairly detailed uh, mathematical modeling and we don't have the answers to a lot of the questions. And in some sense that makes economics really interesting because you can make really big contributions. Whereas I think in, in more developed fields, so I think about physics, it's much harder to make the next big contribution because there's so much history of, of work in the area. You're, you're, people have been working with these models at least since Newton. 
um, in a very systematic way. And so the, the, it, necessarily the questions tend to be much smaller than we have uh, in economics. Well, it sounds to me like you're having a hell of a lot of fun, okay, in this, in this kind of uh, research trajectory that you're on. Yeah, and it's amazing I get paid. Yeah. <laughs> and we're paying you. So we're looking very much forward to the results of your next project, and, and hopefully it will shed some light on these kinds of problems and what we can do about them going forward. And so just welcome um, to the INET Economists Group. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be a member. Thank you.